today's show and tell is going to look at the topic of vaccination and is centred around smallpox, which was the first infectious disease to be fought on a global scale. It is based on a couple of articles which can be found on the R Warwickshire website, which please do check out if you have not done so already. Smallpox had existed for thousands of years. Traces of smallpox postules were found in the head of a 3,000 year old mummy of Pharaoh Ramses V. Smallpox is caused by the variola virus and gets its name from the Latin word for spotted. This is a reference to the small pus filled blisters which appear on the face and body of an infected person. The reason it is so dangerous is because it is an airborne disease and thus easily spread by coughs and sneezes. When an outbreak occurred it could have a devastating impact on a community and here we can see a burial register from the parish of Shipston on Stour. At the end of 1744 it's been recorded at the end of that year that 150 families have been affected, 406 people have had the disease and 48 have died from it. Remaining with the register, we can see that each um, death from smallpox has been recorded with SP marked against it. Looking at the previous page, we can see that the first appearance of the disease was in August and that it peaked in the October. 18th century Shipston on Stour was a market town with about 200 households. So we can surmise that almost every household was affected by the disease. Those that survived were usually left scarred and sometimes this could be severe to the extent that they may be maimed and thereby left unable to work. Twenty-eight years later in 1772 we can see that there is the threat of a further outbreak. This is a vestry minute book again from the parish of Shipston on Stour and on the 26th of April it was agreed to inoculate all the poor inhabitants being parishioners that are willing to be done. It's limited to parishioners because the cost of this is going to be borne by the parish by a combination of subscription and the poor levy, a form of local taxation. The inoculation is to be carried out by an apothecary for the sum of six shillings a head. Inoculation did not prevent epidemics because not everyone could afford the procedure. But here the parish has decided that it is a worthwhile investment to help prevent sufferers who may become a long term burden on the parish. The apothecary in the 1700s was some of the most common medical practitioners. It's interesting to note that a week later, the um, vestry meeting decided that no person be admitted into the town after Thursday next, and they called this by way of inoculation. So social distancing is not a new phenomenon. At this time, inoculation would evolve in exposing people to tissue from scabs caused by the smallpox, either by putting under the skin or up the nose. The intentional infection with um, smallpox to create immunity was common in some parts of the world before it was introduced into Europe by Lady Mary Wortley Montagu, who was the wife of the British ambassador to Turkey. She brought the practice from Constantinople and their daughter was inoculated in 1721. As you can imagine, infecting somebody deliberately with smallpox, albeit a small dose, is a dangerous um, procedure. Um, there is a risk for the person who is receiving the disease but also for anyone who that person then comes into contact with. It had been observed in many uh, rural areas 
that those who had been in contact with cattle seemed to have a natural defence against smallpox. Edward Jenner, who practised in Gloucestershire, was aware of this and set out to prove that using a less dangerous disease like cowpox to inoculate could be effective against smallpox. He succeeded in this in 1796 and during the early 1800s vaccination became popular for those who could afford it and wanted it all well and good but as we can see from our vestry account the poor would have to rely on the um, parish or on charity. The first step towards compulsory vaccination came in 1840 when an act was passed which made variolation illegal and provided for, for optional vaccination free of charge. The poor law had recently been reformed and with the Registration Act of 1836 there was a structure on which to hang a vaccination scheme. The poor law guardians could set up a vaccination service via its medical office officers. An act in 1853 made vaccination compulsory. When a child's birth was registered, the registrar was to hand out a blank vaccination certificate to the parent. Each child was to be vaccinated within three months of birth by the public vaccinator for the district or other medical practitioner, who then sent a certificate to the registrar that the vaccination had been done. Further acts in 1867, 1871, 1873 and onwards refine the system. But the great thing about a process and bureaucracy is that it creates lots of records. Our largest number of vaccination registers are contained in collection CR51 which is the collection of the Warwickshire Board of Guardians, which reflects the poor law setting. So these are administering the poor law in the county. We have an extensive collection of vaccination officers registers, as we can see from this excerpt from our online catalogue. The vaccination officer was appointed by the poor law guardians and he was to enforce the legislation. There are actually 43 vaccination officers registers for Warwick alone. This register comes from the Ulster Poor Law Union and would have been sent by the vaccination officer to the Poor Law Guardians in this instance Ulster. You can see that the information contained in the register on the left hand side reflects the um, information contained in a register of births. So you have the name, date and place of birth as well as the surname and trade of the father or mother if the child were legitimate. It also records to whom the notice requiring the child to be vaccinated was given and then on the right hand side of the page we record whether the vaccination was carried out and by whom. The named individuals may have been the um, public vaccinator or someone prayed privately. On this page we can also see that unfortunately Norman Harris had died uh, just shy of three months old. We can also see on this side whether someone had already had smallpox or was deemed to have an insusceptibility. So in this case, um, we have an example here of Tom Aston having insusceptibility. By the late 19th century, further refinements had been made to the legislation and there was some opposition to compulsory vaccination. There were varied arguments ranging from an infringement of liberty and government interference it was unsafe or it was unnecessary. The use of calf lymph was ungodly. There was also the feeling of stigma as it was administered via the machinery of the poor law. 
Because of the nature of the information contained in these records, there can be a useful body of records for family historians, especially for cross-referencing purposes if the information elsewhere is perhaps partial or incomplete. Finally, I cannot leave this topic and Ulster without mentioning the wonderfully named Septimus Bodger, who was the public vaccinator for many years. A native of Cramlington in Northumberland, he practised in Ulster for many years and this was his home. We hold contracts relating to his appointment as public vaccinator for the years 1896, 1907 and 1930. He was also a police surgeon and a factory Act doctor. We hope that you've enjoyed this journey through vaccination via some of the records you might not expect to find such information and via a set of records you probably never thought we had. Thank you.